Hello, gang. Uh, it's Chapo back once again for you. Um, it's me, Will, here. Uh, joining me is Matt and Virgil. But uh, we are not alone. We have a guest this week. It is time once again to check back in with our friend David Roth. David, how's it going? I'm doing all right. How are you all? Pretty, pretty fresh. Pretty fresh and fly, as always. But, um, you know, I, David, I wanted to have you on because... You just wrote a piece in The New Yorker that touches on Starship Troopers, Total Recall, and uh, RoboCop. And I just think, like, you know, I, I, I saw what you were doing there. It was a pretty shabby attempt to get yourself invited on the show. <laughs> but I have to say, it worked splendidly. So uh, kudos to you. I, 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 we, I do want to talk to you about the, uh, the age of Verhoeven that we're all living in in a little bit. Because, I mean, speaking for myself, if there is really one thing that the show uh, stands for and, you know, is about, ideologically speaking, it's that Paul Verhoeven is a prophet and his text must be studied by the righteous man to achieve enlightenment. It's a cheesy pander on my part, but I'm here. So who's to say that it was wrong, really? Well, it worked. Um, but before we get into that, I, I do just want to touch in on, you know, our president. He's my president and yours. And, you know, uh, over the course of the Trump administration, I've relied on my friends um, and their ability to sort of channel, sort of imbibe the ether of the current moment and uh, sort of regurgitate it in a way that makes sense to anticipate, you know, the presidency of Donald Trump. And, you know, I turn to Matt and Felix for these things, but also really more than any writer currently working. Uh, it's 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 got to be David Roth. It's got to be the Roth man when it comes to just sort of really... I don't know, communicating the, the, the character of Donald Trump and like what he really represents. And there's been some there's been some good stories this week uh, that we should touch on, starting with uh, Roger Stone getting his sentence commuted by by the big man in charge. Uh, now that uh, Roger Stone is free once again to uh, roam our streets and recruit, um, you know, strong, uncut men to fuck his wife. <laughs> As uh, as as well he should be, obviously. I've enjoyed seeing pictures of him. I like his new sunglasses that he has. <laughs> I have to say that uh, I'm very disappointed that at no point immediately after being uh, having a sentence commuted, he showed up in a playful, like a uh, vertical striped old timey prison outfit with a cap. <laughs> And and like a big to celebrate iron ball. His independence. A big yeah, iron ball chained to his ankle. Ball chained to his leg and holding a holding a a pickaxe for breaking up rocks. They take off they take off the prison chain and put on the sex chain. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of him getting out of jail and they're giving him his personal effects back and it's just pocket watch after pocket watch. <laughs> He's got him in a giant sack. These are all yours, Mr. Stone. over his back. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they give him uh, the 80 wristwatches he, he uh, you know, was processed in and the Matthew Lesko Riddler suit as well. <laughs> and he's just like, I'm back, baby. The handcuffs After, are like, off. The nipple clamps go on. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple escape attempts with like an umbrella that has a helicopter come out the top of it. And yet he's still <laughs> free man right now. <laughs> But um, I mean, as an addendum to the the Roger Stone um, sentence being commuted, uh, David, I know I know you must have seen. Um, I think it's the Assistant uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Michael Caputo. Tweeting oh yeah, a, tweeting a congratulatory photo of I don't know how should I describe this? Uh, the world's most rotten looking lobster to just like cheers I, to you, Roger. And it was a uh, it was like it was it was like if you cut it, you know, sort of cracked into a lobster, and it was all just the green stuff, and it's yeah, it's, it's shit. That's I what it looked it was, like. Stefan described okay. it as a just a condom full of sand. Like it is really one of the most Stefan heck. It is. I don't think that you could make a lobster look that upsetting. Like it looked like a mitten that had been cut <laughs> down the middle. You guys, after being you're, boiled. you're embarrassing yourself a little bit because it shows you're showing that you're not aware of the new. Haute cuisine wave of microwave lobster. <laughs> the whole picture itself was, it came out uh, maybe Friday or Saturday night. And that was definitely one of those moments where I, you know, it's not like I go anywhere 
anymore. So it's just me and my wife. And I showed it to her and I was like, I have to, to post about this. I'll be back in a minute, which is not like what <laughs> I have to go to the laboratory. <laughs> yeah. It, like, it's not what you want, but it's also like this is to the extent that I have a job right now. It's like if somebody's going to put like if some undersecretary of human services is going to put a fucked up lobster online, like I need to, to respond. I can't just let that shit go. Uh, Virgil, I've put the lobster photo in the chat. So just uh, just 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 peep that at your own leisure. Um, yeah, no, but I mean, like, you, David, you, you are, yeah, you're, you're, you're a go-to for someone. <laughs> it's pretty good, right? For sure. When you see the lobster. There's just bacteria in there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we you replaced guys, the lobster meat. <laughs> Once again, you guys are embarrassing yourself. You, you guys have been to Red Lobster too much. You haven't sampled rare artisanal <laughs> Gowanus Canal lobsters. The only, the only explanation I have for this is that he's already eaten the lobster and is just sending Roger Stone a picture of the, the husk. Yeah, like, this was for you. I'm sorry, I was very hungry. So I just put the napkin in it because I thought you'd like that because I know you're into weird shit. I'm sorry about that. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that uh, Roger Stone has incorporated lobster carcasses into oh, his yeah. sex play. A little yeah, bit no, of a gentleman's I'm in- evening of lobster play. I think lobster he's not play, above it. Yeah. I'm into lobster play. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very erotic animal. It's one of the most erotic animals. Yeah. What's good Absolutely. about that ad, too, is it in the same way that a lot of the really bad Trump food picks are like, it's like a Ben Garrison cartoon. Like, there's just little shit hiding in yes. every corner of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like labeled, but if no, you, no, yeah, that, it's 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 the little details. It's not just the hideous lobster. It's everything around. So the other it things too. on the table in that ad are an empty glass of red wine, or almost empty, a bottle of water, and then if you look in the in the back, lurking, this is the compositional coup uh, coup de grace or whatever, is just a a box of popcorn like you'd get at like a bar mitzvah. Oh yeah. Or a golf course. Uh, there's there's also a shot of tequila, like a, like oh, a, good, an, cool. an empty yeah. shot of tequila next to the red wine. And there's a baguette that appears to just be somebody popped open, like a, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a Pillsbury, one of those rolls of Pillsbury, and then didn't put it in the oven. It's they incredible. just brought it out to like, ah, and here's some uncooked dough for the table. Yeah. If anyone would like that. <laughs> you order the lobster, well done, and the baguette, extremely rare. <laughs> <laughs> this is the European fashion. You people are showing yourselves to be uncultured no, no, uh, yeah. rustics. Uh, uh, David, you are you you are sort of like the the studs Turkle of chronicling the um, <laughs> outrageously fail meals uh, served at various <laughs> Trump uh, hotels and casinos. I mean, there's there's the classic um, uh, martini shot as well. But oh, I remember, God. I remember once it was it was uh, it was at one of his golf courses. He had a he had a steak salad named after his daughter. That was just like just just a just a small hill of meat on a it was a very very like very rare meat piled up on a few pieces of arugula, and he All the it was named after his treated, beautiful daughter. The vegetables get treated so rudely at his places because they're basically they're like middle fingers more or less that like you'll get like some steak and it's sitting in like a puddle of like broken butter and then they just like on top of it just one asparagus spear they're like fuck you and just like yeah. throw that on top. Imagine it like bouncing like in a red lobster ad and then they just keep it moving, send it out to the table. You'd think they'd go like, oh, we hate fuck, fuck vegetables. We're not putting them on. No, no. You you defame and debase the vegetables. Yes. You ritually, yeah. you profane the vegetables. You must go on killing parsley. It is. <laughs> <laughs> that's like what's so remarkable about. It's all this like 80s style kind of like luxury golf club food yes. and stuff. So there was, the thing with the lobster was like, I remember after the the picture went up and people were responding to it, there's a a lemon, a half a lemon in like a little bag of cheesecloth. And that is like how lobster was served when I was like a child. Like when I saw like my grandfather get it at like a restaurant in Jersey City and he was like, oh, nice. That's a good size lemon. Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) That that was like 1984. Sometimes, sometimes you skip on the lemon. Yeah. (laughs) No, and and then the That's bag will the bag will um contain all of those awful lemon seeds, you know, yeah, and a nice little cheesecloth yep. sack. But a lot of the the younger people online were like, "What's in the? Why is there like a little bag of marbles on the <laughs> next to the lobster?" And I was like, "Oh, well, this is like obviously you didn't go to a seafood restaurant when Jimmy Carter was president <laughs> because like." <laughs> really showing just, like, your some, age. Some really glamorous shots of like a uh, a shrimp cocktail that's just like a couple. A couple shrimp floating in a SpaghettiOs liquid. (laughs) 
<laughs> so the thing that haunts the the, the 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 to me the archetypal Trump food and and David has talked a lot about this is the heat lamp roast beef. Yes, yeah, wet. That to me is the that is the Trump meal. It is a hunk of gray uh, uh, beef that is under like a like a easy bake oven sixty watt bulb, and it's just sweaty and dry at the same time. And it's right next to dinner rolls the size and color of like those orange softballs. Yeah, that that's they the, use the dinner rolls are like I think sort of the key to all of this because yes. it's like that's an easy thing to not get one that looks like it's made out of like a flame retardant material. That's like like technically a flotation device, <laughs> that, like out of which a sandwich can be fashioned. And yet, like they always every time I've seen a roll on one of his buffets, they're bigger and more fucked up than the last time. Yeah. Like some of them are like things you could start with like a King's Hawaiian thing. Like everybody knows how to make that work, but then they just keep getting bigger and like oranger. And so orange. It's upsetting. Just, and, and, and wet. Like always like the light is always hitting them in a way that suggests that there's a sheen on top of yeah, it. Yeah. But even it though is, it's supposed to be a roll. I feel like he eats like most of his meals are like that too. Not oh, just yeah. because I don't think he like we know that like he only likes like two or three types of food and like doesn't really like he's not a guy that likes a lot of things. I don't yeah, think he's, he's not like a he pleasure it, he guy. He doesn't enjoy anything. Yeah. Yeah. So that like eating a steak is like a thing you do because it's like the most expensive form of food in like imagined in 1987 yeah. when he, his like brain went into energy yep. saver mode and just <laughs> kept it moving. <laughs> yep. When it comes to great steaks, I've just raised the steaks. The sharper image is one of my favorite stores with fantastic products of all kinds. That's why I'm thrilled. They agree with me. Trump steaks are the world's greatest steaks, and I mean that in every sense of the word. And the Sharper Image is the only store where you can buy them. That's exactly <laughs> it. It's like that's what he that's what is that's denotes classy from when he was a kid. Yeah. So that's what he eats, even though he gets no pleasure from it. The stuff that he apparently likes to eat. I, I don't mean to hijack the podcast with this. No, it's just by all means, no, 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 please, please. It's been a long time since I've had the opportunity to talk about how much Trump loves white rice. David, his David, food. <laughs> David, we are no stranger to controversy here. I know. I was going to say this is uh, yeah, you're going to get a, a negative response, but I have to I have to say what I think, which is that Donald Trump loves to eat just plain white rice. It is apparently one of his number ones. <laughs> God, it makes so much sense though, because yeah, it's he, it, what imagine the psychic horror of being completely like subsumed in luxury and having absorbed like the sensualist ethos of like a decadent Roman emperor, but not actually enjoying anything. Yeah. Like this is like, no wonder he's an insane idiot and like the most unhappy man on earth. (laughs) I think it's, yeah, I think it's why all the aesthetics of his shit are so berserk because like he doesn't, he wouldn't know when to stop or like how to stop because he doesn't really understand why he started in the first place. Like this was, I wrote about this back uh, last winter when they did the the Christmas decoration video, which <laughs> two years ago, Melania did one. And it was like all the trees were blood red. Like it was like pure Kubrick shit. And this time around, it's just her walking around like in an empty White House, like sprinkling plastic dandruff onto garlands or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like... Like, I am, am Jewish. I've been Jewish my whole life. Like, I'm married to a Gentile, but, like, not a religious person. Like, even I know how to decorate a Christmas tree. Like, you just go up to it and put a thing on it. It's not, like, hard. It's actually a very nice thing to do. And yet, like, it's just not in the equation for them. Uh, Chris just sent in the, uh, in, in the, in the Zoom chat <clears throat> um, a photo of the, uh, the salad where it's just, like, a, it's a whole bell pepper oh, with no. a little smiley <laughs> face cut carved into it. And, <laughs> And f- and filled with like ranch dressing that's leaking out the top like some fucking lobotomy. <laughs> yep. Also, as with as with all Trump stuff, there's a lot more going on there. You got a salt and pepper shaker on the tray, and then you have the some the massive pastry. Scone. Yeah, it's like a yes. it's like a sal- it's like a salad. Mm, yeah, eating healthy for lunch. Just gonna have uh, some vegetables. You know, have a plant based meal. But on the side of it, you have <laughs> the world's largest like fucking like I don't know scone or sort of glazed apple strudel or something. It's yeah. it's this mystery pastry that I'm sure would uh. Um, negate whatever health benefits eating the uh, smiley face pear would. Oh no! It also has would give that you fucking heads. that that pepper looks like one of the fucking masks from Halloween three. <laughs> yes, <laughs> silver <laughs> shamrock. Yeah, <laughs> you eat that thing and then your face turns into your fucking crickets. Just melts off. <laughs> 
Your face melts off and you just keep thinking about how Christy Turlington was very unfair to you. <laughs> very unfair. The- I, I sent that specifically in response to the vegetable must be desecrated. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, like, it's a ritual profanement of the concept of a vegetable. Yeah, this is definitely something that it's like to look at this salad is to instantly be transported to like uh, like Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt standing in the rain wearing hats and seven <laughs> being like, have you ever seen anything like this? <laughs> Uh, it's just like if they bring you the meal what's in the salad what's in the salad what's in the salad Morgan Freeman goes goes to the library after hours to look through a bunch of cookbooks while <laughs> classical music plays like Marquita Zahn's appetizing <laughs> I used to think that lunch was a fine thing and worth fighting for <laughs> I believe in the first part no this is it's good it's like what if Hannibal Lecter was a vegetarian <laughs> It really is like it's hard to. It's like the way that they like uh, that like Jerry Seinfeld's wife wrote a book about like how to like trick your kids into eating <laughs> yeah, artichokes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, this is like how you would do it with like uh, with Jerry with uh, like Trump. You'd have to be like, it's your it's your enemy. Look, that's uh, <laughs> that's a real estate developer it's that Bruce, you don't like. Bruce don't you want to? It's Bruce and Nelly Orr. Wouldn't you like to eat their yeah. face? <laughs> uh, well, um, as you you bring up Trump enemies, and uh, I think like. Other than other than Joe Biden and, and Antifa and all the people, um, you know, who uh, in, in the streets right now, I, I would say Trump's main enemy at the moment is his own head of coronavirus. Like, uh, you know, the Dr. Fauci, like his own head of the pandemic response team, or I guess P- Pence is the head of the team. But Fauci is the only one with any like medical credibility. And uh, according to news reports, it just they did an oppo dump on Fauci like over the weekend where they just like leaked to reporters like here are all these instances of Fauci sounding like a real jerk or like him being wrong about the pandemic. But it's like he's gotten to the point where he is he's doing he's doing like like attack ads on his own administration. So and I good. think and I think I, I didn't like from reports on it. Like I, I think like the, the main thing that bothers Trump about Fauci is that he's popular and like the public likes and trusts him for some reason. And then for Trump, like that's just like that that's unthinkable to him. Like he he's like, no, like the guy who is the US government's like point man for this pandemic response, too many people like and trust him. Let's do something about that. That's well, always they're supposed been... to like him. Everyone's yeah. supposed to like him. That's what it is. There's always been this like undercurrent with the response to the pandemic that like I remember like early on where Trump would talk about like it's like all these scientists, they're surprised that I get it so much, but I get it. I just get it. I just get this stuff. I get epidemiology. I don't know. Like maybe I just have a good brain. But like that has always been like the thing that like he, I think he wants to like secretly be recognized as like the guy that finds the vaccine. Yeah. And I think that like a lot of the most like outrageous things that he said with like the bleach and shit like that, it's just him like kind of spitballing because he like he thinks that he's got a good enough brain that maybe he can help. Maybe he'll just like come up with something. Like, have you ever tried? I don't know, like, uh, like swallow something weird. Like maybe, maybe the germs don't like that. <laughs> swallow some I, a lot of like a lot of his, a lot of Trump's like more ideologically vigorous supporters. You know, they take his whole war on the deep state as this actual movement to confront and isolate, you know, elements within the government that are, you know, that persist, that have a, agenda that is not the same as what american voters would be and you know that's a real thing but it's just so funny that they put it on trump because for trump he doesn't like the deep state because they're people who aren't him which yeah. is why he hates everyone because yeah. they're not him well, like, this is well, like a <laughs> dog seeing a, its reflection in the mirror yeah yeah, yeah. this is no, like I mean, he, he's he's he, the reason he's the most miserable person on earth is because he's the loneliest yeah because he because all other people are terrifying aliens to him and any happiness that or attention that they get is the happiness and attention that he should be getting. Yeah, that's like I think part of why he he likes things that are are grand in scale in some ways is that so that he can like generally like sort of like b- bring them into his orbit. It's that weird thing he does sometimes when there's like a, a big hurricane and he's like, we're seeing incredible hurricanes, by the way, <laughs> like since I became president. Yes. <laughs> like I'm yes! not to brag, but like they've been huge. <laughs> Never no, seen you're right. Before. It's like it's like by by. <clears throat> By investing anything with like a uh, uh, both size and majesty, he's like bringing it into his fold. You know, it's like he's sort of metabolizing it in a way that like uh, is under his aegis and command in a way. Yeah, you know, yeah. like and like ideally he would like cut a deal with the hurricanes or the virus or whatever, and that would be his way. Be like, we sat, you know, honestly, I didn't like him, but we we sat down together and we hashed it out. And we decided one hundred sixty thousand deaths is fair, and that's like, and that's what we did. 
but he can't i mean like in this case like you can see like the limits of what he can do and like i think it's just he can trick a few well whatever several tens of millions of people <laughs> into certain <laughs> believing certain things but he can't like pivot or like you know whatever well, except that he has I mean, to share if you know i mean to another example of his, of the 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 suppleness of his brain and his his sort of his his knack for for following others and just sort of putting his own brand on it is that it came out this past week that joe biden had taken some sort of like neurocognitive exam <laughs> that was administered by a doctor and then trump immediately came out and go i take one every week and the doctors quite frankly are surprised at how well i do i ace it <laughs> i ace it <laughs> I love the, the doctors. He also talks about them like shaking their heads in amazement, which is also something that like I honestly believe is true. Like, if yeah, you probably. Ask, yeah. Like, like, if they're like, really? He got five out of five still? Yeah. They're like, or, or if they're like asking him to count backwards, you know, from like 13, and he just like tells a story about like seeing up Suzanne Summer's dress at a nightclub <laughs> instead. <laughs> Like you would shake your head if someone did that. You'd just be like, well, all right. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess like the, the other big... um. I don't know, political or policy push right now in, in, in this stage of COVID that is being uh, sort of woven into the Trump reelection campaign is this is this big and, you know, <laughs> almost genocidal uh, demand that schools must open in the fall and that like any school that doesn't will be deprived of federal funding if it's a public school. And Betsy DeVos is, of course, talking about, well, you know, if the if, if, if the public schools don't want to open because the teachers are worried about their health and safety and not spreading the virus, then we'll just send all the kids to the private charter schools that are run by like the DeVos, Eric Prince, uh, you know, t- Taliban network. It's incredible shit. I mean, Truly. it's just like it, it's it's astonishing because like, you know, at, at, in no way is this country like have a hold on this virus at all. And it's just like. When it was seemed like it was just New York, I feel like so many people were just sort of like, oh, it's not real. It's just there. The, the city's dirty yeah. or whatever. But like now, yeah, yeah. like not just like, you know, Florida or Arizona or California, but like all over the country is seeing like what New York went through in April right now. And the idea like this is just going to go on. And we're getting to the point where like half a million dead from this disease is like not insane to think about or like to ponder like if, if things continue according to plan or not according to any plan i guess it's so hard to to sort of process just the reality of that because i don't think any of that is wrong it's just also like i don't to see like the way in which the failure happened like if you told me that like a good faith effort was made and that like our healthcare system wasn't up to it or like state governments weren't up to it like all that's true and of course it wouldn't be surprising to see that but the idea that like there was this effort, like people did do the right thing for like two months and like locked down and, and tried their hardest and then just like nothing fucking happened. And we pretended that something happened during those two months and tried to start the thing back up again. It's like it's so ghoulish that like honestly, like it surprised me even as someone that's like been paying attention for, you know, the last I mean, longer than than it, it gets maybe 2014 is the moment we take like a sort of a sharp downward turn as a as a governable country but i wouldn't have predicted that it could be like this i i i did because oh, yeah, yeah there's no that's 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 your mr. Charm, mr sunshine over here yeah. yeah well no because i knew as soon as we buttoned up it's like uh oh, we're all going inside well what's gonna happen nothing we don't have yeah. the capacity the social or the the medical capacity to use this time uh wisely or fruitfully so people are just gonna get bored and that means that the only option is normalizing the deaths. And what do you know what? That's what we're doing. That seems to be, I think everybody I know has like some people in their family or their like extended circle who did just like legit get bored of it and stopped acting like it was a thing that's happening. Like I know people who know people at Disney World right now. Like, yeah. And it's just like, that's a thing that they did because they were like, I mean, I guess because they really wanted to go to Disney World. But also at some point, it's not like a partisan politics thing. They're like, oh, no, we did this back in March and April. It's over now. Because well, like, that's but, what you were told. Well, I mean, when you make a country like ours to, and you, you, you stuff it with, you make, the, you make people's actual aperture of freedom in their lives smaller and smaller and then compensate for that by loading more and more emotional energy onto their consumption and 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 like recreation as the markers of their freedom and you tell them and they tell themselves all day every day that they are free but 
that's the only freedom they actually have is where to go to dinner and whether to go to Disneyland. When you say, okay, no, none, you can't do any of that stuff either. There is no, there's nothing to fall back on. There, there's no like social generative meaning to fill the hole. So people essentially go insane uh, or they decide to ignore the fact that there's a fucking pandemic because it's the only way they can assert themselves. It's the only way that they could be the free citizens that they tell themselves every day that they are. Oh, how soon you forget what gaming is. I mean, I think you can see that with a lot of the like the struggle picks of like reopening restaurants where it's like it's one thing like I want to go to. I mean, I don't want to go sit outside on the sidewalk like with like vermin running around and eat sushi right now or whatever. But <laughs> like the places that we care about, like I want to go back to them and I want to support them. But there's pictures. I remember seeing one of people in Chicago, like basically under a tarp eating wings <laughs> while it was raining. And I was like, this is like a friend it pointed sucks. out that they're basically like, it fucking sucks. And like, if that's what you miss about restaurants is that like someone else fries something for you or like you give someone money and then they just do shit for you then like that's the only part of that transaction that is like identifiable as itself because I, the rest of it is is you're like whatever sweating in the rain like hunched over your friends with chicken all over your face i mean i guess like just back to like the the, the school openings thing um i mean it, it's just i mean i guess like it's it's always more ghoulish when you're talking about in, you know inflicting things on on children or just making it so that like oh like oh you have to go back to school i guess things are going to be okay or hey look you know kids hey they went to school during world war 2 so really what what's the difference is you know i mean matt you said that the uh, the ruling class was uh, just getting tired of schlepping children down to fucking uh, little st james to do solid sacrifices so now that we're just going to do it in every school district in america like you know yeah can you ima- can you imagine how much orgone you can accumulate with like uh, 100,000 <laughs> dead kids all that human potential and adrenochrome <sighs> just going into the atmosphere to be to be lustily breathed in by our nation's uh, immortal gargoyle class <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, like, you know, uh, just broader than that, though, I, th- I think it speaks to what the how I got, you know, like how the people in charge, how they how they really view education and public education in general, because, you know, I mean, like if you're if you're talking about, you know, they're going to they're going to send kids back and like put them behind saran wrap or, or make them do classes over Zoom or anything like that. It's like, well, they're obviously not learning anything. I mean, like, talk to any public school, any, any teacher at any level who's had to try to, like, conduct any sort of classroom at any level over Zoom and just, like, to get a sense of, like, how much, you know, how much is actually being taught or retained by anyone. But, like, more than that, I think it's just, like, a, a big key to reopening the economy and sending everyone back to work and that, like, education is viewed primarily as just a warehousing function for children so that their parents can, can work eight or nine, ten hours a day. Yeah, and a lot like, of my friends that are parents have said this, that they're like in their kids, you know, are trying to we're trying to go to school over Zoom and stuff. And like there's like four hours of actual learning. And then like the rest of it is just like keeping them occupied more or less. Like there's not like classroom wise, especially for little kids, like there's not eight hours of shit to teach them. That's why they like go play recorder in like a music class or go like run in circles in a gym class or whatever. And that serves a purpose, too, because they're around other little kids. But if they're not around other little kids, then just making them sit in front of a computer for eight hours is cruelty. And, you know, one of these one of these the, the more bright and enterprising young minds will probably, you know, what with computers these days, f- find some way to print out sort of like a life size movie stand up of themselves and sit it in front <laughs> of their laptop. And then they'll be running riot. they will be l- latchkey kids out, you know, out in the streets causing causing chaos. Every generation gets the Ferris Bueller it deserves. <laughs> yeah. I think kids are wearing one thing in these Zoom Zoom classes because remember one of the big things that schools do is teach you how to be an employee. Uh, and you know if everything's going to be Zoom meetings, at least kids are learning how to sit in a Zoom meeting. Yeah, this also feels like the sort of thing where like the problem of putting kids back in school could it's another thing that like could be fixed if the state was interested in doing it. Like there's a lot of empty space. There are like ideas that you know about how to sort of make this work in a way that's safe for teachers and students. But that's not like what's being talked about. Like there's not like any data involved or any big plans involved in trying to fix any of the shit. It's just kind of like, you know, it's getting to be that time of year uh, when you don't want your kids around so that you can go back to whatever selling cars or some shit. And like, and that's grim. And like the the other the other really disgusting uh, aspect to all of this is like you know sort of as an aside to like the the school reopening stuff is is this debate over. 
you know, are the unemployment benefits people getting uh, too much? Because, you know, for a certain amount of people, you're actually making more money collecting unemployment than they would working a job. And that, of course, you know, that incentivizes not working a job. And we can't have that. But like the the, the debate is always like, oh, well, like if, if that's true, then the problem is uh, getting un- getting any unemployment benefits at all. Not, and not that like jobs just pay way too little. And like may- <laughs> maybe if, if you are making more money being unemployed than working a job, like maybe you shouldn't work the fucking job. Or, like, well, maybe- also the ins- the insanity of the, the just the 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 disconnect the the app the, the psychopathic inability to really absorb anything that that conflicts with those sort of uh you know supply side nostrums you don't want people to go to work you don't want people to leave their houses ideally there's a fucking virus that's killing people and you're spreading it by going out of the house people have to leave the house for things but if someone can stay home and not work, that is in the current situation. Forget all the other stuff. That is good. That is better. That reduces the likelihood of transmission. And they're like, yeah, but unemployment rates. Apparently, like one of the reasons that uh, that there was so much resistance to a second round of of uh, unemployment stuff uh, among like the high level Republicans in the Senate and in the Trump administration is that they think. They actually think giving people money could co- they, the, could cost Trump the election because it means the unemployment rate will be higher. Like that's I mean, how we, captured we about, they are. Like, this may be to, the only the thing insanity. that could, this may be the only thing that could save his reelection at this point is if he yeah. kept giving people a fat fucking check up until the fall. But that's how that's how ideologically captured they are. Is that is that they're so conditioned to see unemployment as bad and they're so fixated on on the supply side ideas of what causes unemployment that they're like, no, no, even though you could have everybody or a lot of people, a lot of more people staying home and being able to stay in their houses. And oh, I don't know, not getting evicted and becoming homeless during a pandemic. Uh, but that means that the unemployment rate will be, you know, 15% instead of a 10 or something. And we're going to lose because people would rather be working. And it's like, that is you want them to think that but i swear to god most people aren't thinking that way right now yeah i don't think that like the this thing is like i mean the most vulnerable people have never been more at risk in more ways like the idea that the debate is like do people have it too easy is psychotic (laughs) and yet like that's again that's the only conversation they can really have that's the only like valence they get i mean it's cliche to say it but like the disconnect, the disconnect between our ruling class and the conditions on the ground for most citizens of this country is it's fucking pre-revolutionary French. It is not supposed to happen in a theoretical democracy. Yeah. Like like it has, I, a- democratic institutions are supposed to prevent people from getting that out of touch. And somehow they have not. I feel like we're backing into the Verhoeven thing very gracefully. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, <laughs> let, let, let's go there because, uh, uh, David, you, you brought this up briefly. And, uh, you know, if we're going to be talking Verhoeven, I got to share with you guys. And, and, Chris, I just put this in the chat. If, if, we could, if you could throw that up on all our screens here, that'd be great. I just want to share with you guys, like, the most Verhoeven fucking black pill shit I've ever seen recently, which is the, the Disney World Welcome Back video. Oh, can we, yeah. can we just watch that real quick? Uh, Chris, if you could pull that up. Welcome home. 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 Welcome home, everyone. Welcome, citizens. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, so I'll just describe it. at the end there. It's it's a, it's a it's just like a, it's a montage of uh, frontline Disney employees wearing surgical masks saying "Welcome home," which is so disturbing already. Like Disney World is your home. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you've Come never played with us forever. Yeah, you've yeah. never yeah. left. Thanks, you've <laughs> all you've always been the goofy here, Mister Torrance. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, it, it's just uh, the ma- they're all wearing the masks. They're, they're all wearing masks, like and they're how, sa- the hyper. The hi- want to talk hyper normalized shit, man. Just so welcome back. <laughs> yeah, Do it's... not become accustomed to the churros. <laughs> <laughs> no, but at at the very very end of it, it's it's a stormtrooper 
And then, like, in the Stormtrooper <laughs> voice just says, Welcome home, citizen. It's just, it, it might as well be the, the Ed 209 fucking staring yeah. at you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think they ever call anybody, do they call people citizens in Star Wars? No, I, I think so. That's the no. no. word that's, from Star Wars. That was a Carly Fiorina thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, talk about, for, like, service guarantees citizenship and citizen. Ship guarantees getting to catch Corona on the fucking magic yeah, right. teacups. <laughs> a log flume. To like, yeah. But yeah. Like, mostly to make people like me angry is why you're on the log flume somehow, but you're doing it. My favorite thing is that they lock their account after they publish that. Yeah. <laughs> I saw Disneyland, a, but lock their account. There's an edit of that video with the opening theme from The Shining in it that is, yeah, as it's with so any good. of these things, whenever you recut it, it's just like beat for beat, perfectly fine. Like yeah, <laughs> no, but I like I, I think in the shining uh, recut of this, it's just they like because everyone has a mask on, they can very easily redub the audio, and it's just all the workers just desperately saying, "No, stay away! Please don't come here! <laughs> S- save yourselves! Don't don't come here!" But man, like yeah. th- this Disney World shit is really, really twisted, and like you know, obviously, like it's been a problem in our society for quite some time now of like adult Disney people. And but like this is really like uh, this is this is a new height. And, you know, I was just I was reading about this and it's just like that welcome home thing is like you just heard a refrain from some of these people who are fucking, you know, lining up to just have like, you know, other people's saliva go into their mouth on Space Mountain. And they just kept saying like, uh, you know, like it just it feels like home to me. You know, we just had to go home again. And it's just. Oh man! Yeah, no. This this is this is the we are in the age of Verhoeven. That is that is the yeah. that is the theme yeah. for this episode. It's it's really, woo! It's the it's the pleasure principle taken to its logical. It's it's a wep, It's the weaponized, nuclearized, plasticized pleasure principle. A, a society devoted completely to uh, a, a notion of democratic indulgence. That that's where you end up with people essentially losing their mind. And after being cooped up indoors because of a pandemic, deciding to risk their lives so that they can be with the people who are realer to them than anybody else in the world, which is their friends from their uh, Disney licensed uh, properties. But like it is definitely it has the Verhoeven element of seeming uh, like just kind of unconvincing on its face. Like that is like so ghoulish that you would think that anybody watching it would be like, why is like a man in a surgical mask? doffing his top hat at me like that's supposed to make me feel anything but upset and yet like somehow it works for people like i don't want to say it's like there's no accounting for taste or whatever like there's certain things that like i think are built into the human brain like that is uncanny enough that you should know that like you run from that yeah you know i mean like and, and you know let's get into it if we talk we're talking about starship troopers you know and like you know matt virgil and i did uh, a screening of Starship Troopers at uh, Lincoln Center, uh, I think, I don't know, 10,000 years ago now. But, you yeah. know, uh, one of the, the things we talked about, yeah, in the before times. And one of the things that, Matt, I think you talked about in, in analyzing Starship Troopers is that, like, the, the joke works because Verhoeven's giving you a version of, like, the entertainment that the society he's depicting would d- display to themselves. And like right. a, a movie that you would watch in Buenos Aires after your, you know, rollerball game or whatever, <laughs> you know, and like, but the joke is that what he creates is really not at that different at all from like most American movies. And like the, the, yeah. the ease with which people sort of like uh, sort of swallowed it or didn't get the joke is just sort of testament to that uncanny valley between, you know, the Third Reich and uh, the Fourth Reich America. Yeah. Yeah, that was I read a lot of the reviews, um, like just sort of like mainstream reviews when it came out, like in the post and Roger Eberts and stuff like that. And the reviews were all like obviously not necessarily getting the gag of it, which I think is like the, the idea that this is basically a movie that would be made in the 23rd century of the Federation is like 100 percent. Yeah, it's like it's a movie but, that would be made if the Nazis had won the war basically yeah (laughs) yeah and so over right down to the fact that like all the the sort of jokes are sadistic and that like there's something about it that's just um that's unpleasant and that like all the reviews noted it without noticing it somehow that they were just like like roger ebert who's generally you know like as astute as your middle brow critics are you know ever got was like you know it's perfectly competently done the bugs look great you know like whatever it's like edited well but like where's the invention where's the fun like where's the sense of, of this being <laughs> the an adventure the sense of yeah, wonder and and it's that. like, that's right man like you're getting it now like it's like 
this is what it would look like if like you know whatever people with no sense of any of those things were making it i'm honestly you know in a way i think about it for uh starship troopers is actually verhoven essentially is too talented and has too much taste to actually do it as much as because like the 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 the, the thing that makes him and his work and the satire and his stuff specifically starship troopers so great is that he is fully confident in himself which means he never feels the need to wink to the audience. Yeah, there's none of let that. Let them like, know the, like that he's in stuff on it. where it's like yeah. this is an anti-hate satire, by the way. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you. I mean, the, the closest like, the closest uh, Verhoeven ever gets to winking at the audience is when Doogie Howser just strides in frame in full SS, like the full Gestapo officer's yeah. uniform. Yeah. that's as close as you get to be like. And that's at the very end. That's like the punchline of the movie. <laughs> yeah. and he uh, talked about that in some of the interviews that he did too, where he was like. It was important to be that people not miss the point. Yeah. And so, like, but I mean, it's like you're two hours and five minutes into the movie then before you finally put him in like the big leather fucking like <laughs> duster and send him out. Yeah, you, but, you, the yeah. Thing you, is, you is include, that- wait, so yeah, you include a, a little bit in, in your piece in the New Yorker about, um, it says uh, when, stu- when, when studio executives complained that the Federation's banner was a Nazi flag, Verhoeven reassured them, no, it's completely different colors. <laughs> 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 Even though it's this like giant eagle crest, like clutching a skull or something, it's the first thing you see. <laughs> yeah. It is the first thing to appear on screen. <laughs> but the, but like the, his his evocation of that culture, it's actually they're more tasteful than us because like look at what like Starship Troopers came out in what ninety seven, yeah. Uh, within ten years, the Transformer movies started coming out. And the Transformer movies are like our starship, like our culture's starship troopers, where it's the unironic, non uh, uh, satirical version of like what of where like our militarist consumer culture ends goes towards. And it's just a it's just a fucking uh, it's a Cuisinart of just sensory overload (laughs) and, and, and just CGI garbage. That and like weird even... upskirt photography and yeah. like John Turturro too for some reason. Yeah, like, I no, like seen the is way more movie. respectful of women even in Starship Troopers at this these not this Nazi movie than Bay, Bay was in any yeah. of his films. Yeah, the Transformers movies are like kind of a I haven't seen them and yet like bits of information from them will periodically get kind of like stuck in my brain like as they float past. I've seen you know, every in, in one the stream of, them. of garbage. So there'll be like a, apparently like Optimus Prime at one point reveals that the Transformers were involved in the Underground Railroad during yes, slavery. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> oh, also, I'm so happy also to know that. Also the Nazis in World War II. Yeah. And they were classic. part of an underground society of, of like human cooperation that included people like uh, Harriet Tubman uh, and Frederick Douglass. So that were, but they weren't, they're not saying that Harriet Tubman was like turned into a car. No, no, no. <laughs> she was one of the human train, helpers. David. She was turned into a train. <laughs> right. that's silly he, he was she was one of the well, helpers well what, what, the, what, uh, what i the, always thought is very disturbing is that they don't talk about if the autobots were like fighting for the uh for the uh you know allies during world war ii does that mean the decepticons were like turning yeah. into trains to auschwitz this is, there's so much to explore there in the uh well, what, what, in, in the former's verse i mean well one thing to explore is certainly like a parallel that that i would draw between the the original the first transformers movie and starship troopers is that they are both in their own ways parables for the war in Iraq, but like separated by the gulf of the actual war in Iraq happening. Because yeah. like That's you know, Starship absolutely Troopers, true. Starship Troopers is like it is the best movie made about the war in Iraq before it ever happened. And it like it, yeah. it called it's an every fucking shot. Culture like, devouring, total like whatever, forever war. And yet like made at a period of like like Verhoeven talks about like he was concerned about America becoming fascist. And, you know, he's like, I see it everywhere around me. But it was like in 97, what he was talking about was like George W. Bush executing too many people in Texas. That was like the example that that he gave, which, I mean, obviously was disgusting. And yet, like, really feels kind of quaint almost relative to like everything that's happened since then. But that's the thing is that the real the, a true artist is able to sense the trajectory. Yeah. And, like while the rest of us are like normalizing everything as it happens and saying, no, this is normal. This is the way things are. Therefore, it's the way things should be. And it's fine. The true artist has got the antenna going and they're like, oh, I know where all this leads to. And, you know, having grown up in occupied Holland probably helped him in a way that it, it, oh, and that's why he's so good. And his, 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 the fact that he is an American is why he's the best satirist of America, because he has it. He remembers something that happened 
uh, like more than a week before, which yeah. as Americans, we are trained to not to just forget everything as it happens, essentially to just like have a hole in the bottom of, of the bucket of our like historical conception. It's a weird end note to his like American career. He made one more movie in Hollywood and then he just went back to Europe. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, some of it was that like, I guess Starship Troopers didn't do well or something like that, but it yeah. did, it's hard to look at a movie that's that like, just like suffused with disgust and <sighs> anxiety about like the direction of things. And then just imagine him continuing to make a studio movie every three years. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I like mean, he made one. He made the the Hollow Man. Invisible Man, or yeah, Hollow yeah. Man, yeah. yeah. And he hates it and doesn't like talking about it. And then he just like went back and made yeah and made Black Book, which is like it's a great movie. As good as any movie that I think. Made, yeah. I think what happened. I mean, obviously, there's the compo- a commercial component because Hollow Man was a bomb, and that might have made it harder for him to get the movie he wanted to get made. But I mean, I I, I I'll, and Hollow Man is not great, but I think what he was trying to go for there, the idea of this person losing any sense of morality by virtue of not having any uh any rec uh, any consequences for his actions that's essentially the story of america in the 90s and ever since is or, or basically since world war ii like we are a country who cannot suffer consequences which means we will n- we cannot develop a morality and we cannot act morally because we will never have the the pushback of any kind of uh of negative response to any negative thing we do yeah. Well, David, I want I wanted to ask you just about Starship Troopers because, like I said, like I've always viewed it as like the a, a perfect war in Iraq movie that like that channels uh, the Bush era and like you know Johnny Rico and his friends just being all like, let's kill them all, you know, yeah. kill all the bugs, get them is like you know that 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 real let's roll moment where like ninety percent of the country was just like totally on board for this fucking disaster and then and then we land on clendathu and of course it turns into a fucking bloodbath and you know no one likes to think about that but like how how does this movie speak to you about like the trump era where there is no like big ongoing like ground war happening but like at the same time i get the same johnny rico feeling from people showing up to disney world you know like that are just yeah. ready just ready to be thrown into the virus fucking like you know meat grinder yeah that's the part of it that I think surprised. I hadn't, I'd gone many years without seeing it uh, before rewatching it for the story. And it was that part of it. I mean, I remembered the, the, you know, action parts of it, which is basically, you know, two thirds of the movie, but the, it's that feeling of, of kind of everything being finished of like this period of like after conflict, after dissent. And just what you're left with is this kind of like the drumbeat of like propaganda war mass death and then like also the the inversion of everything in the society that remains on earth to like fluffing and resupplying the war machine because and everything the, has that, been everything yeah, has yeah. been winnowed to yep. the one the, the actual values of the of the of the society like all, Which, the, all the inessential things have over time been like just le- like booster rockets falling away and the, the only thing left is the is the is the cone of just militarism. Yeah. And that's the part of it that feels like the the most contemporary in kind of a, a grim way is that like the culture as it exists outside. I mean, you don't see anything on Federation TV. There's not like fucking sitcoms or whatever. Like it's news. It's advertisements to join the military. It's like fake debate shows about the bugs. And that's that. And, you know, obviously we're not 100% there yet. You know, we still, our, there's our, the our Marvel Cinematic are. Universe. <laughs> our parents there, are there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that is basically what it is, that there's like this, like, you don't want to say that it's like anhedonic or whatever. You want to like diagnose it as like clinically or whatever, because it's a, a silly movie about, you know, whatever it's about. But there is like, that is like, to me, like what we were talking about before with Trump about this, like the fact that he doesn't like anything, the fact that people that, support him most ardently don't really like anything but him Mm -hmm. and really mostly hate the people that they think they hate Mm -hmm. that like the, the dissolution of anything like interesting or pleasurable into this conflict is the part of it that felt most recognizable. And then also like even more claustrophobic than I remembered it feeling. 
Because and, another part of the, you know, the movie is about how, like, being in their army and their culture fucking sucks. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, terrible. everybody and, hates each other and, and treats each other like shit and, all the and time. And one of the things you point out um, in the article that I guess, like, you know, I, I had sort of felt but never really been art- articulated, like, uh, this clearly, is that, like, you know, their entire, the entire Federation society is, uh, you know, built around military service and then this, like, this, this total mobilization and war against the bug species and that they've like dedicated like every element of their culture into like, you know, martial valor and military strength. But it, you, you could almost miss that they're all, that they're really terrible at those things, that their society is, suck. is unbelievably weak. And I guess like I had never really picked up on it like that many times. What like, or I guess like I, I kind of had, but like it is so clear in the movie, even by the end that humanity is losing badly in this war oh, yeah. and that like there's, there's, one, there's one scene at the very end of the movie where it's the last like federation newsreel you see and it's like a, a phalanx of like the mobile infantry troops and they're like i'm doing my part and then like someone turns to the camera and it's just a child in a, in, yep. in a full battle uniform holding a rifle and he's like i'm doing my part and it's like they've reached like the red army is a mile outside of berlin phase of this war yep. by the end of the movie where they're re- recruiting children into these fucking yeah. like human wave attacks against the Eating grubs and like yeah. also so like that all like the psychic shit with Doogie Hauser at the end where the brain bug where it's like it's afraid it's like dude that's not psychic all that psychic shit is bullshit like they're just making yeah. it up they're, they're completely they show, making at the it end, up they show the so they capture the brain not to whatever spoiler alert to those who were curious at what was going to happen at Starship Troopers they capture the brain bug they bring it back and they start experimenting on it and you see a little bit in one of the newsreels of the experimentation and it's just poking it with like a <laughs> yeah, stick yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's that, all well, he that, got. That that's that, I like that scene a lot because that's that's Verhoeven getting into like the psychosexual terrain of fascism. Yeah. Because they fi- they get the brain bug and it basically is a giant vagina, and then they take that big uh, uh metal thing and when they put it in its thing, there's a censored sign over yeah. it just to like let you know that this is literally a ritualized penetration of and, like and a also feminine coded other. And it's also Verhoeven's like uh, a sly attack on like American movie censorship where he's like, I've just shown you two hours of the most incredibly grisly violence maybe ever put to film. Of just like of, of just uh, bright eyed, uh, good looking young people just being <laughs> getting bitten just, in just, half, just shredded for an hour. limb from yeah, limb like, for or like ninety minutes, and then like any, anything that's like a vaguely subtly penetrative sexual act is like censored. You know, not yeah, gonna, the not things that are censored. The things that are censored on the Federation Network are uh, penetrating the brain bug. Matthew, thank you so much for the opportunity to say that. And then also a cow getting eaten by a spider. Yes. But the rest of it is like the like fucking guys getting killed like live on TV. That's you know whatever. More that's the cost the, those, of doing the Mormon the Mormon uh, settlers Outpost, who get yeah. torn up. They're all their yeah. corpses are just like in on television, like headless bodies, just like, like a rag Jackson dolls. Pollock. Canvas There's so of much fucking of that stuff like. All the the brutality and the failure, like it's not a subtle movie, but he does. There's so much of it in there that they kind of like sneak it in around the margins. There's a little bit about a televised execution. I'd totally forgotten that. Oh yeah, uh, Ed Newmeyer plays the guy uh, that's getting executed. Oh, oh really? I, didn't I, didn't know that. Nice. I didn't know that. Yeah, and there's the one of the first things where like a meteor, like they, they're claiming the bugs are shooting rocks at Earth. And they mention, you know, that it's like this time we were ready, and it's just sort of like, all oh, right, so you lost another city, like, <laughs> like the way you're going to lose Buenos Aires. You're just kind of like everybody knows that Rotterdam got smashed. Like again, sometimes it's like that. You know how bugs are. <laughs> I like I, I, I one thing that you pointed out that I hadn't really thought about before because I enjoy the movie so much. You know, just every time I watch it, is that is that especially for an audience that's not you know, keyed into it. And one of the reasons it wasn't that successful is that the action scenes are no fun either. Yeah. Like there's, there's no, they're like all that, like there's no elegance. There's no tactical, uh, ingenuity. It's just these guys screaming, firing off like their entire magazine and then getting bitten in. Half. Yeah. <laughs> so this is something that I read a bunch of stuff before I wrote it. That was like, first of all, was good enough that it like set me back a week. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to do, like I read the Umberto Eco essay on fascism, right. uh, yes. or fascism, or fascism, yeah, yeah, and it's fucking perfect and even more prescient than Starship Troopers is, and like so that like cost me two days because I was like, well, how are you gonna? Why would you write anything now about this? But there's stuff in there that I I think Verhoeven very much incorporated into this, and it's not necessarily to say that he was taking the observation from Eco himself, but about how fascism insistently and like as a a sort of a tenet 
of its belief underestimates the enemy, that it can't believe that they are capable of victory, but also, you know, it can't conceive of a world after the war is over. Like right. the, the conflict is, is the point of the whole thing. And so that first assault on Clendathy, which is basically just like, if D-Day, if you did D-Day at like noon after like sending an email being like, we're coming, <laughs> it'll be early afternoon. Like, it's, they just show up and get like, their yeah, asses beat. They lose 300,000 people Eisenhower is like, day. you know, Operation Overlord is ready for your say-so, sir. And he's like, uh, yeah, I guess we'll do it this weekend, whatever. Right, Fuck whatever. It. It's, um, <laughs> it's not, is, is this important? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like all of that stuff, like the, that inability to like think of the bugs as anything but bugs is like, Somehow the thing, and then they are basically just bugs, but like that creates this fascination with them, but also makes it impossible for them to be defeated. I mean, I, I think really good stuff. You know, like, and, and then especially like if you look at, like we said, Robocop and Total Recall, which I mean, portray uh, societies that are ruled by a kind of corporate authoritarianism where it's just like, you know, capitalism and the market are like the only things that like determine the value of human life. And, and Starship Troopers is more like an explicitly like fascist military dictatorship. But I think one of the things that Verhoeven gets in his depictions of fascism, whether it's corporate or military or American or whatever, is that he, I think he really captures like a, a, a certain libidinal pleasure for the individual in sort of surrendering themselves to this this larger body politic and especially in starship troopers it's like there's you know like he he makes clear that there's like uh there is an act of like sort of self-fulfillment and even like sexual liberation in sort of surrendering your life to this collective yeah where it's like that again this is like another thing from one of the essays like the idea of like fascism is like this fixation with upon beauty but without sex that it's like it's all about like yeah. schematics, and, and the perfect you know, the so perfect th- scene that illustrates that is in basic training where they have co-ed locker rooms and showers, yeah. and they're all showering together, and like everyone's naked, and there's you know like when I first saw this movie at thirteen, I was just like, oh yeah, this would be yeah. Yeah. this is this is, boy, uh, this is it, this is what I want, yeah, hell yeah. So many people responded boobs. to me about that being like that was like their formative nude scene, yeah, which is such a complicated. Like, you know, it's so, it's, so, it's, life. it's so great because it's so unsexy, and if you listen to the DVD commentary with Verhoeven he talks about that scene really illustrating for him uh, like the the fascist ideology and mentality of these characters because like yeah like they're all hot and naked and young young dumb and full of cum and they're all thrown in together just soaping one another up but nobody's horny Nobody's fixated yeah. on, on sex or anything because they're they're so sublimated, like their individual bodies are so sublimated to this larger cause that no one's even considering like the sex act whatsoever. Because and then the scene where where, where Johnny Rico and uh, what's her name, not Denise Richards, uh, D- Dizzy, Dizzy Flores, Dizzy, yeah, yeah, Dizzy Flores, Meyer. the scene where they, my wife actually, the, yeah, <laughs> the scene where they. <laughs> Where where they finally hook up, you know, after they've been blooded in combat, as far of, as far of you know, Ratchex uh, Rangers or rough Ratchex Roughnecks, yeah, it's like they only have sex after Michael Ironside like gives them permission to. Where he's like, yeah, he's like, we're rolling out in like ten a minutes. Officer gives permission to smash. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> permission to nut, sir. Permission granted. Like I was talking about how Verhoeven understood like how a society that puts its, all of its values around personal indulgence will destroy itself. And Starship Troopers is at the other end of that continuum, or it's at the other end of that process. It's after, like they say, the brought uh, when Brad Check talks about how democracy brought the yeah. world to the brink of chaos. No, here, yeah. that, I, I like got to read this that, quote. That's Did- when the resources are, have, are no longer tenable with individual indulgence, and that's when you get all of that sublimated into this this massive project. But it still needs to have an erotic element to it. And that eroticism, instead of being about sex, is now about violence. Yeah. I just got to read the quote from Ratchek here, where he's uh, the history professor, and he says to his students, This year, we explored the failure of democracy, how the social scientists brought our world to the brink of chaos. We talked about the veterans and how they took control and imposed this ability that has lasted our for beautiful generations. Our beautiful veterans. Our beautiful veterans. We love our veterans, don't we, folks? <laughs> our beautiful veterans. <laughs> they took control. <laughs> Tough. Dominated the space. <laughs> well, I, I, the as long as we talk- like, if, if Trump was, a, if there was a Trump-esque character in Starship Troopers, he would be, he would be made fun of. He would be pathetic. He would be like uh, the Marshall Bell uh, simpering bitch general who gets who Ratchek almost murders and then gets killed by the flying bug yeah. uh like, Trump's a civilian as hell man yeah. he is not oh, yeah. a citizen yeah he, he, like, he does but, not but have he, citizenship but but he represents the society that 
burns out and then and then but without any kind of intervention like any any kind of intervention against the values and against the the mode of production the exploitation at the heart of it it just reconstitutes along less selfish lines but just as de- destructive only now it's all pushed outward all, all of the- our desires turn into the desire to conquer i think that's really interesting because that gets at the one thing for all the you know whatever the like crash course in like famous essays about fascism that i tried to give myself before writing it all of them make a big point of talking about the leader mm-hmm. and that's like every fascist you know society that we've had at least in the 20th century was like it was based around some sort of like cult of personality right. and some charismatic central figure that's not in starship troopers you basically don't see leadership at all you see like a sky marshal who fucks up and resigns and is disgraced and re- is replaced by somebody who's just as bad. Yeah. Like that is no, but there's not any sense of like, there's no one that people have invested their hopes in or in which like, there's some sort of like politics that's like funneling energy back towards the aggrandizement of any particular individual. This is like what comes like after that. Exactly. Yeah, yes. yeah. It's mature fascism. If fascism yeah. was able to be, to be able to be stabilized, which it isn't, it is eventually destroys itself. Uh, but you know, it could hypothetically take over a whole planet, but then it will eventually destroy itself in its pursuit of conquest elsewhere, which is what seems to be in the process of happening in the movie. Like as yeah, you said, they're getting the, their ass kicked. They, but they might worry with they, they could be like Berlin forty five with the bugs showing up. Yeah. You know, uh, in in, in uh, Helsinki. What what's the Geneva? Yeah. Like the, the the bugs are going to be in Geneva in a year. You know. Because yeah. uh, it's like nation's pride or something from uh, Inglorious Bastards, but yeah, in like a mature, uh, if there was a way to stabilize fascism at least on like a global level, you would eventually out, you would m- mature beyond having like the single figure because getting to one would be destabilizing. Yeah, so I mean, you would this, have, this to have some sort of would... stable higher, some stable, so a stable uh, like oligarchy uh, of, but instead of it being around something as pathetic as access to you know, uh, 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 capital, it's, it's military prowess. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, like, this is what I mean about like, uh, Verhoeven is the prophet, like his text must be studied by the righteous man. Cause it's like, if you follow the trajectory, like Robocop to total recall, I mean, we are living in Robocop right now, like oh, yeah. without any exaggeration or variation whatsoever. And then I guess like total recall will be what happens if we ever like, you know, if Elon Musk ever breaks these earthly bonds and sets up his fucking, you know, colony on the moon or Mars or whatever. But yeah, I, I think Matt gets it exactly right. Like, like fa- the, the fascism of Starship Troopers is what replaces capitalism and like this crass, idiotic consumer culture when that eats itself alive and finally collapses. Yeah. With it, like, but as you said, crucially, without any sort of intervention on the behalf of like humanity and a more like yeah. de- decent equitable like distribution of resources and as you said production like this like the, the starship troopers universe is what will replace the failure of capitalism and liberal democracy when it eventually crashes yeah nice to think about yeah that's good we love well, it well david you <laughs> we know what we, we love, we love it. it we love to talk about it but david um you, you know we mentioned our beautiful veterans and as long as we have you here i gotta ask what is your take on Trump and his fixation with the beautiful boaters? I'm so happy you asked, Will. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I think he likes people that like boats and they have big flags with his name on it. I also, though, I am I couldn't have dreamt this one up. There's definitely and I know that like Matt and I've had conversations about this in terms of things that you kind of like considered were like maybe too dark a gag to make in like 2015 that this like fully happened yeah. in like, you know, 2017. The boaters is like beyond my capacity to imagine. It's such a beautiful word for him to say over and over again. With quotation marks. With quotation marks <laughs> and it's capitalized, so you know. But he'll bring it up at like, you know, he's talking about the real polls that we see and you look at the boaters, thousands and thousands of boats down in Florida. We're doing very well. I think that it's like there really isn't anything that his people can show him at this point that suggests that he's doing a good job in any way. Yeah. Except for like a bunch of like sunburned hogs driving in a circle <laughs> on a lake yeah. in their boats but like you can see that and it's like you know so there's a bunch of boats and they all got the flag that's got your name on it sir so uh, there's no there's nobody else it's just it's just a lake full of boat it's a totalized space of a trump appreciation on that water so there's a whole type of person that as somebody growing up you know suburban new jersey like i grew up in a, in a very republican part of the state but it's a different type of republican than the the boat people 
that like the boaters are a type of, I have a, a buddy from Akron who had a whole like unified theory of lake people of like a, as a type of like Midwestern. Oh yeah. Reactionary. I, I can, I can, I can confirm that definitely. Is and a I thing. think that that's like, so you'd obviously be able to speak on that better than me, but is that like a cousin to what we're seeing with the boaters? Cause it feels right to me. Oh yeah. No, the, the Midwestern boater is it's it's exactly who we've talked about it forever as the real like not the only people who vote for Trump or support him, but the core, the altar comforts, uh, suburban Americans who really enjoy uh, recreational excursions of some kind and who have fi- who have who have basically built their politics around defending their specific pursuits now so yeah, there's leisure depending preferences on, dep- depending on where they live it's different like some places it might be uh it might be like four-wheeling or hunting or something uh but if you live if you've got uh, proximity to a lake it's getting like a uh, uh like one of those flat bottled uh touring boats or or, or a little speed boat and and zipping around uh until you just die of sun poisoning <laughs> and we love it and, it, and that, like it. i said like that's that because there's nowhere there's so like you know human expression and human self-actualization is such a such a uh, constrained element in america now that that becomes the sink the libidinal sink of your life and so everything comes fixated around uh around protecting it and and validating it yeah in new jersey that was lawn shit uh but it's like it does seem like at some point if you have a lot of money and no actual interests that give you pleasure. Yeah. At some point you just have to find new ways well, I mean, to spend well, the money. You know, but like when you have the money, you have access to more of like, like spaces that are yours or can be like, you know, dominated by you and your recreational pursuits. Like a lake being yeah. one of those, like the, the lawn being the most perfect manifestation of like literally my property. Yeah, the lawn and, is like yeah. the classic American plot that you own. But then if you're also, you know, if you've got a whole community of boaters, then the entire intracoastal waterway could be yours. <laughs> it's manifest destiny. It's 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 just it, it's individual <laughs> manifest destiny. You 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 tame the lawn and then you tame the lake. All right, well, they'll keep uh, fighting and they'll win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'll keep voting. Well, the, uh, and they'll uh, win. <laughs> The, uh, the the well, the last thing I want to I want to bring up, and uh, uh, th- this one, is, this is out of left field, but I I, I I need to speak on this. I think it needs to be addressed, and I, I, I in particular, I'm interested in uh, Matt's ideas on this. Uh, David, have you been following the latest uh, QAnon conspiracy involving the uh, furniture company Wayfair? Yes, I'm. I mean, I would say that the the politically astute answer would be I'm aware of the controversy. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't really feel for, comfortable for, for those who are, speaking on it because it's happening so fast. Yeah, for those who are uninitiated in the Wayfair conspiracy, um, QAnon people have like uh, begun looking at uh, items that are available for purchase on Wayfair's uh, website. And there'll be things like, you know, a dresser, uh, an armoire, uh, a dining table. And like, you know, like Ikea, they, they give these, you know, r- rather bland mass produced pieces of furniture like names. And they've been matching the names of like uh yeah like a like a cabinet on Wayfair to the names of children that have gone missing in the United States recently, and they're looking up and they're like, w- "Are you telling me that you can spend sixteen thousand dollars on a filing cabinet named Sandra or something like that?" <laughs> and there's also a kid like a you know a teenage girl that's gone missing named Sandra. So like, I, I think basically now that they've convinced themselves that Wayfair is shipping children to people in giant boxes, pretending that it's furniture. So Matt, am I am I there's missing a, anything with this, or is that a pretty that's accurate it. summary? You got that's it. it. It started on TikTok apparently, but yeah, and it totally embodies that. Like the the like the the, the Americans' brains have been so conditioned by convenience uh, as self expression that. They've mapped it onto everything, even their lizard people conspiracies, where they imagine, well, yeah, of course, if you if you're a member of the cabal and you want uh, a kid, you just uh, go online and order one, and they ship it to you. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I, I was I was looking at some I was looking at some of the comments on, on these threads, and one of my favorite one was like, you know, uh, they, they were like, uh, you know, a while back, uh, a friend of mine, you know, ordered a. a an office desk from a uh, Wayfair and uh, it wasn't quite right or they uh, had trouble assembling it. And uh, they, they asked to return it to Wayfair and Wayfair allowed them to return it, you know, and then gave them a full refund. And he's like, I've always been suspicious of that. It, it points to other sources of funding for this company. <laughs> so I just like the idea that like um, uh, sort of generous customer service is now perhaps 
a signpost for a satanic uh, child a child flag. sacrifice. It's always been that way. If they're not constantly ri- like ripping you off on hidden fees, then where do you think they're yeah, getting? Where's that money? money coming from? It's coming, think it's about coming it. from the kids that they're selling. I'm disguising as uh, you know Ottomans and things like that. What's incredible about that too is that like that much work to create like a cons- like there's actually it's not hard to like learn about how trafficking actually gets done. It's a real thing. Like a kind of a disconcerting number of people that were associated with the Trump campaign in 2016 have gone to jail for it. The guy that ran his campaign in Oklahoma did. Yeah. But like this is it's not like a complicated deal. And yet like they have to come up with these like perverse stories because they like no one else will talk to them except for the other people that wind them up. It's really like fucking grim. The idea of like like all that work instead of just a Google search to see what this is actually like. Like, I, I mean, obviously it's axiomatic. They don't give a shit about it. Like, of course they don't, but it's just like, there's something really like deadening and gross about like the obvious pleasure that they take in devising this stuff. And uh, there's no way to ever intervene on it uh, because it, like, Trump, I mean, the Trump, or, people respond to Trump uh, because he is a manifestation of our social pathologies. And so we share them to extent, lesser extent than him, because by his social position and fame, he's able to be the most of all of them at once. Yeah. But that I was talking about that isolation, like that that sense that everyone else is 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 a genuine alien to you, that you are an individual in like the in, in the sense of being like Robinson Crusoe, wherever you are. That means that you, you, no one can tell you anything. The, the idea that that knowledge and information is is collaborative and that and that we like form reality through consensus that that is so antithetical to the thinking that it wouldn't even occur. And if you tried to explain it to someone, they would think that you were a lizard person trying to steal their pineal gland or something. Uh, Matt, you, you mentioned that this was uh, found its um, like the early purchase on TikTok. And mm. it was uh, like TikTok teens communicating this. And I, I, I like anything that, um, you know, because we, we've made fun of it before, but this idea that like Gen Z is going to save us and like uh, they, they, the kids <laughs> today, like, you know, they, they have all the right ideas. But I, I just like the idea of TikTok teens discovering this conspiracy, investigating it, but, but thinking it's cool and like ordering a bathroom cabinet on Wayfair just because they want a friend to hang out with. <laughs> 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 a, a getting a quarantine bud online. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then just being disappointed when it shows up and it's just a fucking like I, pointing just to a pointing to words in a video yeah. while like dancing to a Doja Cat song <laughs> yeah, about yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Now, anyone who's like excited for the teens, that's a real thing where you know, the dog you point at something and the dog looks at your finger, you know. Like, oh, look at them. They're they're using epic Soviet imagery and communist talk. It's like that's like how Liberian child soldiers wearing like wedding dresses into battle. Like it's just it's just costume. It's cultural costume. The reality of it is being o- online from the age of zero turns your brain into fucking slurry. Yeah, the idea of people. Fi- I mean, finding some optimism in it is like it, it's not something that I personally am capable of doing. But <laughs> yeah. I think it comes back to again like the same idea of like not being able to conceive of even the most outrageous perversities outside of like someone delivering you something and you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you giving, yeah, them, a, yeah, and giving yeah. them a small tip. But like in this case, it's just like, well, these kids are going to, they'll take care of it. Like, yeah. have you seen how good they are at doing the same dances? Yeah. They're, they're like, going to so start us some social democracy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Ugh. All right. Well, uh, that is a, uh, a suitably Verhoeven esque ending <laughs> to this episode. I'm hoping that his next movie will be about um, a child delivery service. uh yeah furniture company masking is a giant human trafficking operation but we need to not worry about that because i do know that his next movie is about a convent in like the 17th century of lesbian belgian nuns so yes yes very excited yes on his bullshit you gotta love it (laughs) give give me more Hook it into my veins. I would like to know you more. You would like to know more. I would more. like to know more about the Belgian like le- no lesbian more. nunnery, Paul Verhoeven. Please keep it up, you you absolute god of a man. I mean that to both Paul Verhoeven and to you, David Roth. Oh, thanks very much, man. I appreciate it. So 